Hello, hello, and welcome to Self Care is Sexy. My name is Chris, and I'll be your host. We're a podcast that's here to generate and share self care ideas with each other. Last episode, I gave you quick ways to sneak that self care into even the busiest of days. I walked through some simple mindset shifts that can help alleviate the constant state of overwhelm that a lot of us are working through right now. And there were some really great tips of how to get some self-care in. If you missed that show, you can always check us out on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, Podbean, Podnation, iHeartRadio, and really anywhere you find your podcasts. I want to give you a quick preview of what to expect from today's show. This show today is about hypervigilance, what it is, how to spot it, what causes it, and of course, some very specific self-care tips that are going to help you heal from hypervigilance, as well as how to change your internal settings that make you actually default to this trauma response. We're going to get to all that and more after a quick break. Okay, welcome back. Today's show, we're talking about hypervigilance. And the reason I wanted to go through this today is because I've been talking to a few people recently who described to me that they're living in this constant state of anxiety. And when I asked them, you know, is this anxiety or just hypervigilance? They looked at me like I had two heads. And I've got some pretty smart friends. So it it made me think, wow, if, if my friends don't know what this term is, um, I thought it was well known. I thought a lot of people have probably been exposed to it or heard this term used before, but if they hadn't, I figured you probably hadn't either. So, you know, I want to make sure that today, as I go through the show, if you find yourself kind of nodding along or that I'm starting to describe what your situation is, I really encourage you to reach out to some outside help. You know, this podcast is awesome sauce. Don't get me wrong. I put my heart and soul into these recordings, but it is in no way a substitute for individualized help. So if you're getting triggered or anxious, I want to encourage you to turn me off and do the next right thing and find someone that you can talk to to help you through this because there's so much value in talking to real people versus just reading about it in a book or hearing about it on a podcast. And if you'd like to share your experience with me, I encourage you to please email me. It's Chris, K-R-I-S, at selfcareissexy.com. I'd love to hear your story and and maybe what you've done to work through your hypervigilance. All right, let's just dive in. So, So first of all, what is hypervigilance? Number one, it is a trauma response. Um, It's caused by a dysregulation of our nervous system. And, you know, it's important to know that your nervous system is in charge of a lot of shit. If you don't really know how the human body works, I'm not going to get into a science lecture here, but your nervous system is pretty important. And when it becomes dysregulated, that's a bad thing. And it typically becomes dysregulated when you're living on high alert, so high alert for a lot of people, including myself, is, is loud noises or competing noises. And uh, there's this feeling of like danger with like no way out. So n- now this does not have to be war. It doesn't have to be bombs dropping all, all beside you. It could be living in a loud apartment complex or your parents fighting constantly. It doesn't have to be severe to be traumatizing. So, so first and foremost, hypervigilance really is a response to being traumatized and having a dysregulated nervous system. Number two, it is also the result of an overactive brain. So if you've ever described yourself as an overthinker, you might actually be hypervigilant. If you feel like you're constantly on alert and you're looking around and you're, and you're always waiting for the next bad thing to happen, you know, you're waiting for that shoe to drop and you're, you're constantly responding to stress as a threat. Everything that can go wrong does go wrong. And your brain is constantly on high alert looking for where's the next problem? Where's the danger? And again, I cannot stress this enough. This does not have to be, you know, uh, people physically violent to you. This could be the result of being in an industry that demands 
you to constantly be looking out for pitfalls and disasters and avoiding problems. So if you find yourself thinking like, man, I'm always on, my brain is always searching. You're always looking for the next thing, whether it's the next responsibility, the next disaster, the next task, whatever it is, this could be hypervigilance. Number three, hypervigilance is being uncomfortable with downtime. So when we're talking about what it feels like in our body, hypervigilance can present as restless leg syndrome, where you're shaking your leg a lot, or you're biting your fingernails or the skin around your fingernails. It can also appear as twisting or pulling your hair or obsessively tweezering your facial hair. So these kinds of things indicate that you have a really difficult time with just existing and and just sitting and doing nothing. Now, this is not your regular, like, I don't like being bored. I always reach for my phone. That's one thing. Hypervigilance becomes a, a problem or it becomes a, a trauma response when being uncomfortable with downtime turns into obsessing about something else. So that's the defining line. We can be uncomfortable with being bored and use food or our phone to soothe us. That's one thing. We cross the line into hypervigilance or into a trauma response when being uncomfortable or being uncomfortable with being bored turns into something obsessive and something a little bit dangerous to ourselves. Number four, hypervigilance is also being really, really good at reading nonverbals. So it, as a trauma response, it's used to keep us safe. It's safe from physical harm or, or abandonment. Um, it's also used to keep us safe from unknown dangers or someone who doesn't have our best interest at heart. So hypervigilance as a trauma response, it, it manifests itself by the constant being on alert and constantly reading people, their body language, listening to their tone, their intonation, their use of words. It's really being hyper aware of other people's intentions and what they're not saying. Number five, hypervigilance is looking everywhere for danger. You're looking for the exits. You're constantly aware of who's coming in and who's le leaving. You're physically sizing people up, you know, assessing if they're a threat or not. And you're placing yourself in a spot in the room where you can always see what's going on. You, you know, you've constantly got your head on a swivel. And again, this does not have to be a PTSD related response. Hypervigilance as a trauma response manifests when we are looking for danger everywhere. And we feel most comfortable when we're sitting with our back against the wall in a corner of the of the room or the home or the or the business where we can see everything that's going on around us. And although you may be totally 100% capable of sitting in other spots in the room, you're always going to feel most comfortable when you have that advantage point. So again, I'm going to run through that list real quick. What hypervigilance is is number 1 it's a trauma response. Number two, it's the result of an overactive brain. Number three, it's being extremely uncomfortable with downtime. Number four, it's being really, really good, overly good at reading nonverbals. And number five, it's looking for danger everywhere. Now that you can see the difference between hypervigilance and anxiety, which if, if it's not glaringly obvious, I'll just sum it up this way and say, anxiety is a state that we live in, that we create that is uncomfortable and dangerous. Hypervigilance is a type of anxiety that is extremely dangerous and is extremely exhausting and is the result of past trauma. It's really a, a positive coping skill that's gone a little bit too far. So again, as I said in, in the beginning of the show, if, if this is something you're dealing with, if you're going through this and you're really feeling like, man, that's me. This is something I'm experiencing. I really, really encourage you to, you know, suck it up, buttercup, and call someone. 
because none of us get through this shit alone. And I am by far no way qualified to help anyone through a mental health crisis. All I can give you is my own personal perspective and the tools that I've been using to deal with this lifelong trauma response that served me very well at a period of my life. And now that I'm in a situation and a, and a phase and a season of my life where that trauma response is no longer serving me, it's taking a lot of effort to unlearn it. And the first way that we unlearn this type of shit is we identify what the fuck it is. Because there's so much power in knowing the difference between anxiety and hypervigilance and uncomfortability. And even though they all sort of sound the same and we all sort of loop them all into the same bucket, they really are very different things that require very different kinds of self-care. So if there's anything that I can impart upon you in this episode today, it's that knowing the difference between these, these terms that we're using is extremely important especially when we're trying to connect with others and really understand what it is they're experiencing. And if we dive down into the words that they're using and we understand completely what those words mean, then we're definitely going to have a stronger, more authentic connection. Once you start to give words to your experiences, then you start to really be able to objectively step outside and look at them and see like, okay, They're not the big, bad, scary wolf under the bed. All right, so regardless if you have used hypervigilance as a response or it's been a part of your experience, either way, my next 10 self-care ideas, while they are very specific to undoing the damaging effects of of being hypervigilant for so long, they can also be applied in any situation, regardless of whether or not you've been through trauma or you've experienced some difficulties, these self-care ideas are helpful to anyone at any point in their journey. They're just specifically geared to those of us who have utilized hypervigilance as a trauma response. So number one, you're going to get to know your vagus nerve. Now, this nerve is so important, and I'm I'm not going to get too into it. If you, if you really want to take the deep dive, go to YouTube, just Google vagus nerve, It's behind your ear and it's a nerve that controls a lot of your body. And like we said earlier in what the the hypervigilance is, it's, it's a response to an overstimulated nervous system. So working with the vagus nerve is how we calm that overstimulated nervous system and working on it slows down your anxiety and it, it lets your it, it lets your nerves know that there's not actually a threat. So you really want to work with this nerve and activate this nerve. You can do it by gargling, um, or you can massage just behind the ear using your two fingers and your thumb and applying a good amount of pressure. Now I I do this probably daily. I'm someone who has lived in this constant state of hypervigilance and. While there are no threats to me right now, I am very acutely aware that even while I'm sitting in the recording studio, my back is to the only door. And I'm aware of that regardless if I need to or not. So working on my vagus nerve has been something that has been so integral and so helpful. So again, you can YouTube it. You can really deep dive into it. You can ask a massage therapist to work on that release because it is incredible when you really start pushing on it and massaging it and and letting it know through physical contact hey there's no threat here there's no danger here we're okay number two i've talked about this a ton on the show but you know me i love to repeat the things that work breath work i talked about it on the last episode i probably talked about it on every episode i've ever done and if you've been listening along you probably know i take pretty deep breaths when i'm recording So working with your breath is extremely important if you want to start healing yourself, whether from anxiety or severe hypervigilance. The most effective breath work that I've done, and I've tried a bunch, I can tell you I've probably tried every type of guided meditation breath work there is. And the one that always works for me is that box breathing. And the box breathing is just breathing in for four counts holding for four counts, 
breathing out for four counts, then holding for four counts. You know, you're just, you're drawing a box with your breath. And I love that breath technique because it makes me count, which gets me out of my head. It makes me connect to my breath, which always calms me down. And it makes me laser focused on something connected to my body so that I'm here in the present and not in my head where the danger exists. Number three in my 10 self-care tips to heal from hypervigilance, you're going to say to yourself, you're not in trouble. Now I'm going to do my best not to get emotional here, but I am really sharing with you something that has worked in my life for so long. And I, I do not gatekeep here. I'm going to share with you things that work and this actually works. Seems super simple, seems almost elementary, but this has worked every single time I have found myself above and beyond anxiety. When I have found myself in that perpetual response of, oh my God, the shit is hitting the fan. And I just repeat to myself, you're not in trouble. There's something about saying this to yourself that relieves that fear of authority. And for me personally, that is the thing that triggers my hypervigilance and my trauma response is thinking that I'm in trouble, thinking I've done something wrong and it's going to result in some kind of backlash. So just repeating to yourself, whether it's in your head or literally saying it out loud, you are not in trouble. It's a game changer. It, it takes back your power. It puts you in the place of what's real because hypervigilance is the result of being in perpetual danger. So if you're not in perpetual danger and you need to heal from that, even if you're not in that state, just saying to yourself every now and again, you're not in trouble and say it to yourself as if you were saying it to a child who is afraid. There's some power in that. You know, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a doctor. I just know what works. I've been to therapy. I've read a lot of books. I've talked to hundreds of people about how they take care of themselves. And these stupid little phrases, for some reason, do the trick. So maybe your phrase isn't, you're not in trouble. Whatever language you can use to help get you back into your body, to help you feel less afraid and to help reassure you that what you're experiencing is real and it's okay, man, use the shit out of that. Number four, work on identifying your feelings and learn to actually feel them. Now, this can seem impossible, but if there is one thing I am going to sing to the high heavens until I am six feet under this earth and that is the biggest challenge that people have who have a hard time making self-care a priority in their daily lives is that they don't really know how they feel. And we end up giving a lot of our power away because we simply can't identify what it is we're experiencing. So we dismiss whatever we're experiencing and we just keep going. And that's why self-care is so hard. That's why it feels like an act of Congress to get you to take your meds every day or to get you to brush your teeth every day or take a shower or take a nap when you're tired or eat when you're hungry. These small acts of self-care feel so difficult because we can't identify when we're tired. We can't identify when we're hungry. We can't identify when we feel lonely or bored or disconnected. And a lot of us don't know the difference between these things. So if there is one way that I can help you to heal from being constantly on alert and constantly in a state of hypervigilance, it's to work on identifying your feelings. Because if you can catch the feeling before it turns into a trauma response, you're going to have better luck soothing it. Number five, you're going to create self-trust. Now, the most important way that you can create trust with yourself is by creating a safe space. I know a lot of people are cringing when they hear that term, safe space. But it's so important to remember that that's a thing. And some of us need it. I know it might have been misused and overused a lot, but safe spaces are extremely important when you're trying to create trust. 
So if you find that you've really lost connection to yourself and you don't know whether or not you have your own back, you don't know whether or not you're going to take care of your basic needs, you got to start at the basics and start creating that trust with yourself. You got to learn to hear your gut, trust your gut. And every single time that you are successful in doing that, you build a fortress, an impenetrable fortress of self-trust that the outside world cannot fuck with. And really, that's what you're looking for anyway. When you're, when you're hypervigilant and you're, and you're trying to protect yourself, you're really looking for a, a safe space. You're looking for safety. That's what you're seeking when you're in that mode. If you can create it outside of being in that hyper vigilant state, then you're more likely to remember in that state that that place exists and it's within you and you take it with you everywhere you go. Number six in my 10 ways to heal from being hyper vigilant, reduce your caffeine intake. Now I know I am a coffee girl from way back in the way back days. I was into espresso before espresso was cool. <laughs> I was a giant nerd. And I remember the jazz band teacher got me into espresso in like the early 90s before Starbucks even existed. So I know a lot of you are cringing right now when I say that. But if you have been living in, in a state of hypervigilance and you find yourself reacting in the manners that I talked about earlier in the show, you got to cut back on the caffeine. I mean, it's one small thing that you can do to help reduce that heightened state. Number seven, take an ice cold shower, or if you can, do a cold plunge. If those options aren't available to you, just get a big giant bowl of ice water and dunk your face in it. And let me just tell you, I've had some experience with this. And, uh, you know, there's that, that moment in the shower before I turn it ice cold where I'm like, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. And then I do it and my nervous system just shuts off. And I promise you, if you've never done this when you're in a state of panic or you're, you're having a moment, as I call it, you do not know what kind of sweet relief lies on the other side of an ice cold shower or your face dunked in ice water. Try it. I promise it works. Number eight, identified paranoid thinking. This is extremely important, especially if you become obsessive in that hypervigilant state. So these thoughts, like uh, they sound like, for example, my best friend hates me or uh, did I lock the back door um, or this happened to me before. Those kinds of th those kinds of dangerous thoughts that that are pervasive and they're on repeat are it's paranoid thinking and it's usually not true. When you identify that that's happening, the best thing you can do, you know, see number seven, go jump in the shower, turn the water on ice cold, shock your nervous system back into calm. You can identify that paranoid thinking because usually when it's said out loud, you hear how ridiculous it sounds. Number nine, we're going to take a page out of Serena's playbook. We did an interview with her a few shows back and she was talking about making a playlist, a dopamine playlist. Now, I, I just went down a rabbit hole on this, friends. And I got to tell you, there's about 5 million dopamine playlists on Spotify. And I dove deep into it to like listen to these different songs that I probably wouldn't normally listen to just to see if they made me happy. And what do you know? I got that like fun, fuzzy, chill feeling when I was listening to it. So I highly recommend it. Get on YouTube if you don't have Spotify. Number 10 and last but not least in my 10 ways to heal from hypervigilance, go check out myofascial release. It's a form of massage and I'm going to warn you friends, this is not your mother's massage. I went, okay, so I checked this out uh, about two months ago, three months ago. Yeah. You know, I had an injury. If you know, if you know me, you know, I went through surgery this summer and I have been, you know, doing a, a various amount of self-care to get through it. And someone had me mentioned that after a traumatic surgery and I had some, some nerve damage, that a myofascial release would be very beneficial. 
So, you know, here's me trying everything I can for self-care and I go to do this and Lord in heaven, I tipped this lady huge because I felt like such an ass. I cried so much because your body really does hold on to trauma. Your body stores it. Uh, there's a book out there. I, I, I haven't read it yet, but somebody suggested to me it's, it's The Body Keeps Score. And I'm certain it will, you know, lay out the foundation and the reasoning of how and why our body holds on to these painful things that we have been through. And you don't have to have experienced trauma to get the benefits of a myofascial release. You know, your body is just by being here on this earth, gravity is causing it stress. So, you know, make sure you're in the right headspace. Make sure you research a good practitioner and go check it out because honestly, it was one of the most powerful experiences that I've had. And, and, you know, this girl has had a lot of massages, so I've had a lot of experience with it. And this one really blew my mind. So get on the Googles, find it in your area. Do not miss an opportunity to release some of that shit that's been held up in your body. All right. I'm going to go through that list one more time. The 10 ways that you can use self-care to heal from the damaging effects of being hypervigilant. Number one, work on that vagus nerve. Number two, get into your breath work. Number three, say to yourself, you're not in trouble. Number four, work on identifying your feelings. Number five, create some self-trust. Number six, reduce your caffeine intake. Number seven, do the ice cold shower plunge or bowl. Number eight, identify paranoid thinking. Number nine, get you a dopamine playlist. And number 10, check out myofascial release. That's it for this week. Thanks for joining me. If you have a story you'd like to share and you want to be on the show, please email me. It's Chris, K-R-I-S, at selfcareissexy.com. Okay, we got some great content coming your way, so stay tuned. And remember that self-care is sexy. We're giving you permission to put yourself first.